Well, welcome to the launch of this brand new series we're starting today called The Journey. And I want you to decide right now before we begin that you are not gonna miss one of these messages. I promise you as you learn about this guy named Paul, the life lessons we're gonna learn from him will change your life. They will alter your life in amazing ways. And so just decide now, I'm gonna get to know this guy because the more you get to know about his journey, the more you learn about your own. Now, we meet Paul for the very first time in Acts chapter seven. So turn in your Bibles to Acts seven. And if you don't have a Bible, we would love to give you one right after the service. Uh, but find Acts chapter seven. Now, once you find Acts seven, hold your place there and go over to Acts chapter 22. So we're gonna start in Acts 22. And then at the very end of the message, we're gonna be in Acts chapter seven. So you'll have both places saved. Now today, as we begin, I just wanna get a glimpse of why it is so important for you to get to know the Apostle Paul, okay? So when you start to investigate Paul, uh, some people highlight the fact that of how much of the Bible he actually wrote. So let me just show you on a screen the table of contents in the Bible. I know it's been a long time since maybe you're like, I'm gonna go to the table of contents in my Bible. Well, here it is. This is all the New Testament books. There's 27 of them. So the Bible wasn't written by one person, uh, 66 different books. And in the New Testament, they're divided up this way. So you have the first four books are the Gospels. That word gospel means good news. That's why it's called gospel. It's the good news about Jesus. And so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John covered Jesus' birth, his life, his death, his resurrection. Covers about 33 years. All right, then you've got the book of Acts. That's why I got you to turn here because it's the history of the church as it started. And so we've got to look at that because Paul's a big part of the start of the church. He's a big part of the spread of the gospel and Christianity throughout the Roman Empire. So we're going to be looking at Acts. But then you've got these things called letters. And most of the New Testament is in a letter format. In other words, somebody wrote it to somebody else. Now, I just want to circle how many of these letters Paul actually wrote. So check this out. Paul wrote 13 letters in your New Testament. That means he wrote half of the New Testament. Man, we need to know this guy. Well, why did he write so many things? Well, he was actually writing many times to churches or church leaders where he started churches. He's a church planner. So sometimes when you investigate Paul, people start with this map, all right? So here's a map, and these are known as the journeys of Paul, okay? So he took four journeys, uh, trips, if you will, and he started churches all over the Roman Empire. And some people start here and say, look at all these journeys Paul went on. As a matter of fact, uh, biblical scholars have calculated how far Paul walked. Now, you guys know there weren't cars back then, right? There weren't, there weren't bicycles. There weren't even skateboards. You know what I'm saying? He walked. And he walked over 10,000 miles on foot in these four journeys. That is the equivalent of going from New York and walking all the way to Los Angeles four times to tell people about Jesus. Man, if I didn't want to know this guy for any other reason, I'm like, man, I'd never know anybody that walked that far for a purpose. And, and so we're, we're going to get to know this guy. But a lot of people key in on the journeys. But listen, you, you need to know more about his journey, not these journeys. In other words, to understand Paul, it'd be like me trying to understand you by you telling me four trips you've been on in your life. I still don't know about your life. All of Paul's life was a journey. All of your life is a journey. And I want you to take out your message notes because we're gonna learn the very first lesson from Paul today, and that lesson is you have a purpose, okay? Now, because you have a purpose, these two statements are true about everybody listening to me today. First of all, every detail of your journey has meaning. So write that down. Every detail of your journey has meaning. If I asked you to tell me about your life, every part of it matters. It's not just like trying to understand Paul's like, well, let me tell you about these four journeys we went on. You still don't know Paul. I wanna know every detail about your story. Every part of your journey matters. Every part of your journey has meaning. And by the way, that means there's no accidents in your journey. It's not an accident where you were born. It's not an accident who you were born to. It's not an accident who was in your neighborhood. It's not an accident where you went to school, how you grew up, where you grew up. It all matters, just like it does for Paul. So uh, I want you to see in Acts 22, Paul is giving his testimony. So we're going to hear from his own lips. He's talking to a crowd of people and he says, this is my story. And look at the details in verse, let's go start in verse 3. Then Paul said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus, a city of Cilicia, and I was brought up and educated here in Jerusalem 
Under Gamaliel, as his student, I was carefully trained in our Jewish laws and customs. Now, and let's just pause here because in this very short passage, we've got four details about Paul that you and I need to know. He's telling us about his journey, about his life. And notice the very first thing he says is, he could have started with anything, by the way. He says, I'm a Jew. You know what he was saying? He was saying, I'm a part of God's people, his family, his chosen nation from the Old Testament. That's who I am. That's my national identity. Now, what that meant, though, is once you write this down, is he's religious. He's religious. In other words, Paul, right out of the gate, is saying, I know there's a God. He's telling you, I know there's a God above me. And he's telling you, I know I'm not him. He's telling you, I know that that God sets rules. And I know that one day I will answer to that God for those rules. And so he's telling us right out of the gate, I grew up going to a synagogue. Listen, if he grew up Jewish, he was in the synagogue every weekend. His parents made sure he was there. Uh, Now, um, I I don't know about you, but I tell people I I had a drug problem when I was a child. My parents drug me to church every day. (laughs) That's Paul. He's like, you got to get over here. You better get here, you better do this. And that means that Paul, he heard the Bible every weekend. He studied the Old Testament. He sang as a child, we know as the book of Psalms, that was his hymn book. So he sang those songs as a child. He grew up under that culture and in the Old Testament book, which is the Bible of the Jewish people. And so as he was growing up, he sang, I'm religious. What is he saying? I know the Ten Commandments. You know what religion says? Religion says, no matter what your religion is, Here's the rules, here's the list. Do this list and God will accept you. Don't do the list and you're in trouble. Now I don't know what your list was. When I was growing up, there were five rules in my house, okay? Don't smoke, drink, dance, or chew, or go with girls who do. (laughs) That was the list. And that is a hard list, by the way. I mean, all five of those, yes, okay? Now if you do that, you're good. If you don't, not good. Now. Uh, By a show of hands online in Corpus right here in the room, please participate. How many of you guys say, you know what, I grew up in a religious environment, Uh, I grew up in a religious home, raise your hand, okay? That's about half of us, okay? That means we're all recovering, to raise your hand, okay? Things are recovering. Paul needed to recover a little bit, but he was so close to the truth by going through this religious exercise that he did as a child. But also we learned, write this down, he was Roman, he was Roman. Now, Paul tells us, he says, I was born in Tarsus, and that's huge. Everybody would have known. It's almost like saying today, uh, I'm from New York City. It's like maybe if you've never been to New York, you'd know about it. Everybody knew Tarsus. It was a free Roman city. In other words, if you're born there, you're free. If you're born to a Roman citizen, you're free. Here's why that's important. In the Roman Empire at that time, two-thirds of everybody in the Roman Empire was a slave. That means they had no freedom. They had no freedom of travel. They had obligation to the person they answered to. And Paul's saying, I'm not like two thirds of this empire, I'm free. Now, why is that important? Because when he meets Jesus, he becomes a missionary. Guess what, he can travel. He can go anywhere he wants to. And we're gonna see him use his Roman citizenship several times as an advantage to get places because he knows he's blessed to be Roman. And by the way, if you were born in America, you're blessed. And if you don't think you're blessed to be born in America, get off TikTok. I'm telling you, if you don't think you're blessed to be in America, you've never been to another country. Every time I get back from a mission trip, I kiss this ground. I was born free. I was born in freedom. Now, no matter where you were born, okay, that's not an accident, okay? It's not an accident. And he says, I was born Roman. Now, also write this down, he was urban. He grew up in the city, keyword there, city of Tarsus, which at the time, that city had a quarter of a million people. Huge place. Some people grow up in cities. Some people grow up in the country. It's okay. Uh, By the show of hands, let me just ask this question online in Corpus, right here in the room. How many of you guys grew up in a city, more urban, okay? Yeah, loud noise, pollution, you know, traffic. How many of you guys, you grew up rural. You're out in the country. Come on. Blue skies. You can hear yourself think. You know what I'm saying? Now, which one's better? God chose it. So don't say, well, yeah, I grew up in the country. That means I'm better. No. Well, I grew up in a city. That mean, No. God chose where you were to be born. And by the way, he can use all of it. 
You say, well, man, Paul was born urban. I was born in the country. I've already missed God's will for my life. No, no, no. He chooses the details. Do you know that Peter, great leader in the church, gave the first sermon the church had ever heard. He was rural. He was country. I mean, Peter's life was a country song. It really was. I mean, he was fishing. That's what he did. He is blue collar. Who knows how many times the word blue collar makes it into a country song? I mean, he had a jacked up pickup truck and he pulled his boat. Well, maybe not the truck, but he had a boat. And God used Peter in that country living. He uses Paul with that urban background. Because Paul says he was born in the city of Tarsus. He also says in Cilicia. And everybody knew that, that Tarsus is the capital of Cilicia. Now, uh, that meant there was a major university. That meant he was exposed to Greek uh, philosophy and Greek culture, and also architecture, massive, impressive architecture like this. Let me show you a couple of things. Here's Cleopatra's Arch. If you went to Tarsus today, it's in modern day Turkey, you would see this. Very likely Paul walked through it. It's called Cleopatra's Arch because Cleopatra actually walked through it. Cleopatra went to Tarsus to meet Mark Antony. Now, you don't get any more Roman than Mark Antony. And Mark Antony and Cleopatra, they got married. And that's a whole nother story. But Paul, that happened about 40 years before Paul was born. Paul knows cities. Paul knows drama. Paul knows politics. Paul knows that all kinds of things happen in cities, and all of a sudden there's trends this way, and then there's trends this way. He knows all about it, and he's not intimidated by structures like this. Let me show you one other one. This is called the Cilicia Gates. It's actually called the Arch of Triumph. Alexander the Great went through these gates 300 years before Paul was born. Alexander the Great, you know why? Because the governor of Tarsus didn't want Tarsus to be destroyed, so he just said, come on in, Alexander. You've already conquered all the other worlds. Come on in. And so literally as Paul walks through his childhood, he knows that everything has a history, everything has a meaning, that cities have a movement to them and a culture to them. You say, well, what does that matter? Well, just think about this. When he meets Jesus, he becomes a missionary. Where does he go to start churches? Cities, what does that mean? He's not intimidated by a city. He's not intimidated by the crowds. He's not intimidated by the architecture. He's not intimidated by the noises, by all the, 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 anything that's, that's pulling at the politics. He, he, know, he knows when he walks into a city, the architecture, he's like, I'm home. Now, here's the fourth thing we learned. Paul was educated, educated. And now, not just anywhere, he was educated in another historic city, Jerusalem, the most uh, historic an influential city then and today, uh, and not just anywhere, but anyone. You can see how he names drops? He says, Gamaliel. Now, I don't have time to unpack this, but that means best of the best. If you're gonna get an education in the Old Testament, Gamaliel was it. And he's name dropping here because he says, listen, I wasn't just educated by anybody. I didn't go to community college. I went to Gamaliel in Jerusalem. And what that means, just let this sink in because everybody kind of knew it. We just have to understand it. When he was 13 years old, he went to college. He went to Jerusalem and he studied under Gamaliel for 10 years. By the time he meets Jesus, he's got a PhD in theology. He has read the entire Old Testament many, many, many times, and he's memorized, memorized the first five books of your Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He's memorized it. Not only that, but he has studied the prophecies about the Messiah because every Jew wants to see the Messiah come. The chosen nation, out of the chosen nation will come the chosen one. He knew every prophecy. He had studied it. He had memorized it. He was looking forward to the Messiah, and he was very committed to protecting this theology and this worldview. Now, you say, well, what, what's the point? Well, just think about this. When he went to the cities as a missionary and he started churches, how did he do that? Well, see, he walked in. He looked for a synagogue. Most major cities have a synagogue, and he walked in. Why would he walk into a synagogue? Because he grew up in a synagogue. He knows how this thing works. I grew up here. I know what songs we're going to sing. I know how the speaking thing works. But watch this. Because Gamaliel is his teacher, that means he has not only the education but the credentials to speak in any synagogue in the Roman Empire. Hey, hey, my name's Paul. I was taught by Gamaliel. You know what that means? Paul's speaking today. <laughs> that, that means, hey, you got the floor. What do you want to say? And all of a sudden, we see how God uses all of these things. Now, again, Paul, what, what does all this mean so far? What it means is where you were born, where you got educated, 
rural, urban, all the details, who you grew up with, all, all of those things, all of it matters. All of it has meaning. Paul, because he was educated in an urban area, he wasn't even intimidated when he went to Athens. Athens was the mammoth of philosophy. And Paul walks onto Mars Hill and addresses all the intellectuals like he lived there, like he, he was not intimidated at all. And he talked to them. I want to show you what he tells them. This is in Acts, and we're always going to look at the words of Paul. I showed you all the things he writes. But Acts 17, verse 27, notice what Paul tells these intellectuals, and he says to them, and by the way, he's saying this to us. He has determined, now he's talking about God. God has determined the times of their existence and the limits of their habitation. In other words, God has determined your time, your place, where you'll habitate. Watch this. In other words, where you're born, what country, city, time, so on. So that they might search for God. God puts you there so you could find him. God puts you in those details of your story so you could find him. Watch this. In the hope that they might feel for him and circle these two words, find him. God wants you to find him. He is not hiding from you. Yes, even though he is not far from any of us, indeed, it is in him we live and move and have our being. In other words, every detail of your life is a tapestry pointing you to God. And don't miss this, friend. You do have a purpose, but you're not going to know the purpose until you find God. When you find God, you find purpose. You were made on purpose for a purpose. And when you meet God, all of a sudden, you meet the one who has that purpose for you. And Paul, we'll see next week, meets Jesus, and then he meets his purpose. But every detail of your journey has meaning. Here's the second statement. Every detail of your personality has a mission. In other words, you were wired the way you were wired for a reason. Every part of your temperament, every part of your wiring, has God has literally orchestrated and engineered the DNA of your life. Uh, you know, um, how many of you guys, uh, by a show of hands, you have, you're a parent of more than one child, so you have multiple children, okay? I just want to see where the prayer requests are out there. <laughs> a lot of stuff going on, all right? Now, have you noticed this? Have you noticed how the same parents can have two children and they're totally different? You've seen this? I've even talked to parents, they're like, oh, our first child was so mild, just so calm. Let's have another one. What could possibly go wrong? One's calm, one's crazy. <laughs> and then you look at these two kids and you're like, y'all come from the same parents? What's happening? I wanna show you what's happening because there's a designer and those kids are wired that way. Different temperaments, different energy levels, different personalities for a purpose. Look at this in your notes, sir. On the screen from Psalm 139, it says, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. In other words, before a mom sees a child, God's been working on that kid for nine months. He has literally been fashioning this child for a purpose. Watch this. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Look at the exclamation point. Like, wow, your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. Now, in Corpus Online, right here in the room, I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, you are wonderfully complex. Now, I don't know if that's a compliment, but it is in the Bible, okay? <laughs> so, hey, turn back to them and say, well, God made me that way, all right? So God made me that way. I, I'm wonderfully complex. The, every part of my personality has a mission, all right? Now, when you don't consult your creator for your purpose, then all of a sudden your personality and passions can get you in trouble. Because when you don't think there's a God or you don't answer to a God or like Paul, go in your own way, all of a sudden your personality becomes your God. It becomes your idol. Look at me, this is just, instead of God, you made me. And I wanna line up my personality and passion to you. Now, notice what happened to Paul. He got in trouble because he was missing the mission he was created to do early on in his life. So Acts chapter 22, we'll continue at the last part of verse three and four here. I became, and circle these two words, very zealous. We'll come back to that. To honor God in everything I did, just like all of you today. Now, he, he, watch this. In other words, he's saying my intentions were good. I was just way off base. Watch this. And I persecuted the followers of the way. Now, this would have been somewhere in, around about 25 years old. Now, I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands, but has anybody in their 20s done something that you're embarrassed by? 
that you would rather I not mention from the stage today that you're a little ashamed of? Some people like doing like this for some reason. I like, uh, but hey, all of us raising our hand, right? This is what's happening. Now listen, he's still owning it though because God, watch, you're gonna look, watch this. He says, man, I used to persecute followers of the way. What are you talking about? That was a derogatory term that Christians were called. Oh yeah, you believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? Then we're gonna show you the way to prison. And we're gonna show you the way to death. He said, that was me. Watch this, I hounded. I mean, he was just like a hunting dog in in the middle of the night. You are not getting away from him. He will find you. He will capture you. He will persecute you. He will arrest both men and women. Didn't matter. Throw them into prison. Wow. Here Paul admits, I was killing Christians. I was persecuting followers of Christ. I was throwing them in prison, and I thought I was right. He was wired for a mission, but he's on the wrong mission. But even though he's on the wrong mission when he admits this, we see details of his personality, even though this is a really sad admission. I want you to write down what we learn about Paul. We'll see this throughout our series. First of all, Paul's intense. Write that down. He's intense. Have you ever met somebody that's intense? It's like, we're going right here. This is what's happening, you know? Now, some people are made intense. Some people are wired, laid back. Hey, what's happening? No idea. (laughs) Hey, where are you going? Hadn't thought about that yet, okay? Now, so uh, online, please participate right here in the room. How many of you guys, you are wired to be intense? Just raise your hand, intense. Don't make somebody elbow you. We already know, okay? All right, how many of you guys are more laid back? You're more laid back. Yeah, it's all good. Man, intense people are married to laid back people. We got a marriage seminar coming up <laughs> in April. You don't want to be there, okay? God does have a sense of humor, but you know, he does that for a lot of reasons, but one of them just so you can decide where to go eat. Where do I go? I don't know. Doesn't matter to me. We're going here. Intense. Now, Paul's intense. But, but here in this passage, he's intense for the wrong thing. But I'm telling you, you didn't want to be, if you were on the debate team, you didn't want to line up with Paul. He doesn't lose. He's right. And he will spend all of his energy. Matter of fact, did you catch the word uh, very zealous? All right, so he's, in, he's intense. Now, zealous is already very. Are you tracking with me? It's already extreme. He's like, I'm not just extreme, I'm very extreme, okay? He said, I, I'm so intense that, that you, you know, you, you haven't met intense. Um, and this word intense in the Greek language, zealous, it means st- to sternly, stubbornly, vehemently contend for something. Now, God wired him that way. He's just debating the wrong things at the moment. Now, but he wasn't a halfway kind of guy. He was an all-in guy. Now, write this down, though. He was also an extrovert. He was a people person. He was energized by people. He loved crowds. He loved having a conversation with you. He loved meeting new people. He wore his emotions on his sleeve. He wasn't afraid to show his emotion in front of people. He he was outward leaning. He wanted to interact with people all the time. Now, by a show of hands, how many of you guys are extroverts? You're more extroverted? Just raise your hand. All right. Uh, And and now, how many of you guys, the opposite of that would be introverted, right? Which means I would like to be away from people sometimes, Okay. I would like to just reflect and maybe think about something real quick. I, I, I don't want to be around people all the time. Okay, so if you're an introvert, would you just please raise your hand? Introverts, yeah. Okay, now, <laughs> extroverts are married to introverts. We got a marriage seminar coming up <laughs> in April. God has a sense of humor, all right? But listen, if you're an introvert, you say, oh, man, God can't use me. Paul's an extrovert. I mean, listen, no, no, no. Matter of fact, if, you're, if you are a true introvert, you're actually annoyed and almost offended that I even asked you to raise your hand. <laughs> Why does he do that? I would rather not be in the limelight. I would rather not people see me right now. Do you mind? Barnabas was an introvert. We're gonna see one of the closest friends to Paul in his early life. And Barnabas was an introvert. And listen, introverts make great leaders. You know why? Because they're listeners. Barnabas listened to Paul, where he was from, and he got it close to his life, and he was an encourager. And if you didn't have the introvert Barnabas, you would never have met Paul. God uses all of us, okay? Now, Paul's an extrovert, but he's also, write this down, he's strategic. Some people are not strategic, all right? They're more in the moment. 
They're just thinking about where they are. But other people look at the steps. Some people are just like, I'm just glad I'm on this step. All of it's a wiring, okay? But Paul was strategic. He was asking how. How do I do this? And, and how do all the parts fit together? And if you're gonna arrest Christians, then you have to get the right paperwork. You have to figure out how you're gonna capture them. You have to figure out what you're gonna capture them with, how you're gonna get them back to prison, and how to convince other people to do this with you, which means, write this down, he's a leader. God had wired him to move other people and influence others. We're gonna see next week that Paul actually got a squad of soldiers to go to another city, and he's the leader of the entire group of soldiers to arrest Christians. So Paul was intense. He was an extrovert. He was strategic. He was a leader. But now remember, God can wire you these ways. In other words, God can wire you to be a leader, but that doesn't mean you're leading people in the right direction. If you take your wiring and you don't line it up with God's purpose, you can lead people the wrong way. You see, if, if you're not careful, you can worship or make an idol of your personality. I'm an extrovert. That doesn't mean you're building people up or pointing them to Jesus. It might mean that you're tearing people down and manipulating them to make sure you have the limelight all the time. You gotta take your wiring and your passion and line it up with the purpose that God gave you. And here's this intense and passionate leader. And uh, Paul knew he had done this. He knew he had not gone to God's purpose. And look at what he writes later in Romans chapter 10. This is Paul. He says, dear brothers and sisters, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for the people of Israel to be saved. He's like, I want all the Jewish people to be saved. I know what enthusiasm, that's that word intense, they have for God. But it is, help me out, two words real life. What is it? misdirected zeal. I want you to circle that. We've all been in the misdirected zeal season of life where you take your wiring and you go away from God with it instead of taking your wiring to the creator who wired you a certain way to say, what's my purpose? And you just try to create your own way in it. Look at this. He says, Paul says, for they don't understand God's way, just circle God's way of making people right with himself, refusing to accept God's way. They cling to, here it is, their own way. Paul says, I was doing the same thing, cleaning my own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law. In other words, Paul's like, it's all about performance and piety. That's how God accepts you. And we're gonna see just how radically different religion is from a relationship that he finds in Jesus. But when you do take your personality and your wiring and all of the intricacies in the, of the workmanship, your wonderful complex you, and you surrender it all to the Lord, watch out. You're gonna find purpose. Look at Romans chapter eight. Verse 28, and your notes are on the screen. It says, and we know, watch this, we know that God causes everything to work together. Now just circle that word everything, to work together for the good. It doesn't say everything is good. He says everything works together for the good. Of those who love God and are, let's just read this together, or what? Called according to his purpose for them. Circle purpose, his purpose. You see, God's got a purpose for you, but you've got to come to him and watch this, when you do, just like Paul finds out, he'll take everything in your life. Now, we've quoted this verse for people when they're struggling or they have a hardship or they go through a difficulty. I know it's hard, but, but God's gonna work it all out and all those things. And you look back, you'll see his hand. All that applies. But did you know this verse also applies not just to the difficulty you've been through, but to your own mistakes, your own failures, the times when you went away from him, he says, when you come back to me, I'll even take the embarrassing moments you're ashamed of and I'll take them and I'll make them a part of a purpose. He said, I'll even take the things that you regret and he does it with Paul. And he says, I'm gonna redeem even your worst moments if you'll trust me. So what we're gonna learn as we walk through this are three things. First of all, we're gonna learn that everybody has a dark side. Write that down, everybody. Everybody. You see, a lot of times we meet people in the limelight and we say, oh, wow, I'll never be like that. Wow, they've never had a bad day, never had a struggle. They don't have any embarrassing moments in their past. And I wanna make you a promise, everybody you meet has a dark side. As a matter of fact, if you buy into the lie that they don't, when I said, we're gonna walk and learn about Paul for the next nine weeks, you're like, well, I'm not coming. What I have in common with that guy? What do you have in common with that guy? He's got a dark side. The question is not, do you have a dark side? The question is, have you taken your dark side and brought it to the light? Now, Acts chapter seven, I promise that's where we would end, so go to Acts seven. And what you're gonna see there is, is that this, these religious leaders arrest a deacon of the church. His name is Stephen. And they arrest him because they are tired of him talking about Jesus. 
and they're trying to tell him to stop, and we don't have time to read all through Acts chapter 7. It's a very long chapter. But what Stephen does, you, you should read it, he talks about the history, and Paul was definitely listening to Stephen. And what Stephen does is he walks through Abraham, Moses, David. He's walking through God's plan of the nation, and then he says, and out of that nation came the one. And then Stephen says, the one is the righteous one, Jesus Christ. And then Stephen says, he is the Messiah, and you murdered the Messiah. Well, at that point, Stephen's speech was over, and look at what happens next, all the way down to verse 57. Then they, the religious leaders, they put their hands over their ears and began shouting. By the way, just a really quick stop here. This is a trend right now. Put your hand over your ears and just yell at somebody. Did you know the moment that you put your hand over your ears and stop, start yelling, you're wrong? It means you've got no comeback. It means you can't have a conversation. It means we can't agree to disagree respectively. It means that all of a sudden you got nothing, so you're going to have force. You're going to be brutal. And yelling is a form of abuse and violence. And notice what happens next. It says, they rushed at him and dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Horrible way to die. Shallow hole, men surrounding you, throwing stones as hard as they can. One hits your rib, starts to hurt, then your knee, then you're on the ground. Then eventually they'll hit your head and you're gone. This is what's happening. Stephen is the first martyr of the church. Now watch this, verse 58. His accusers took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named who? That's Paul. Before his name's changed. That's Saul. So, so angry. Did you hear him? He said, Jesus is the righteous one. He said, Jesus is the Messiah. We're going to kill him. Paul's like, I'll hold your coat. Do it. He's dead. Now, now watch this. Stephen's response is powerful in verse 59. By the way, what do you say when people throw stones at you? It'll tell you who you follow, but watch Stephen. As they stoned him, I mean, rocks are hitting his body everywhere. Stephen prayed it's a great thing to do when people are throwing rocks at you, by the way. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees, shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that, he died. Wow. This is very similar phrasing to what Jesus cried out from the cross. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. In the brutality of the Romans' executioners, he calls out forgiveness. Here's Paul, yeah, kill him. Yeah, he's a Christian, get him, he's part of the way. I'll hold your coat. And then he hears this first martyr of the church, forgive. It was definitely a seed that planted, even though it wasn't growing yet. Look at Acts chapter eight, verse one. Saul was one of the witnesses of this. And he agreed completely with the killing of Stephen. Listen, everybody's got a dark side. Paul hung around violent men and became violent. That's what happens. You become like the people you're hanging out with. Paul was angry and arrogant, a horrible combination. And that arrogance and that anger, it's gonna grow. And next week we're gonna see he's actually literally determined that his mission in life is not only to persecute but kill all Christians. And he's gonna go city to city to find them. Now that is a dark side. Everybody's got a dark side. So, so listen, when you meet somebody, they've got a dark side. The question is not, do you have a dark side? The question is, have you brought it into the light? Listen, friend, I don't know what you've done. I don't know what's been done to you. I don't know what you've been through, but I got a great thing we're gonna learn, and that is, write this down, nobody can outrun God's love. Nobody. Paul shows us through his story that nobody can outrun God's love. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what trauma you've experienced. I don't know what's been done to you or what you've done. I don't know what you've said, what your regrets are. I don't know what your failures are. Listen, I don't know what you've done. I don't know where you've been. I don't know what you wish you hadn't have said, what you wish you hadn't have done. I, I, don't, I don't know all of the regrets and failures and the things that you're ashamed of and you feel guilty about, but I do know this, nobody, nobody can outrun God's love. Next week, we're gonna meet this guy who is fueled by this violence, 
who is on his way to another city to destroy every Christian in every church. And we're going to see that Paul learns nobody can outrun God's love. But for today, I want to show you what he writes because he did experience God's love. He did meet Jesus. And I want you to see what he says. In light of his dark side, listen to this man. He says, and I am convinced. Now, do you hear the intensity? He's not wired to be laid back. Well, you know, I was thinking about, if y'all wanna think about this, maybe it's, I am convinced. I am intense about it. I have no question. I am the person standing here that is convinced. Do you want to come against my testimony? I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. He says, I know this. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. Many of you need to put that on your screensaver. And you need to read that to yourself every day this week. You need to write this down and make it part of a memory. Because this wasn't a sermon Paul was giving. This is his journey. This is his story. And next week, we're going to see how this guy, on his way to kill Christians, that the love of God runs to him. And he is captured by the real Jesus. And all of a sudden, the love of God changes everything. Listen, friend, I don't, maybe you think God's mad at you. Maybe you're mad at him. But I'm telling you, he loves you and nothing can separate you from that love. And so for today, just know that Paul tells us anyone can have a new beginning. Your new beginning can start actually today. Anybody can have a new beginning. Write that down. Paul's life says this. Anybody. You can have a new beginning today. Because when you look at Paul, here's what you see. And just look right up here. Just think about this. If God can take a murderer and make him a missionary, what can he do with you? If God can take a murderer of Christians and make him the greatest Christian missionary in the history of the church, what can he do with you? I don't know what your dark side is, but bring it to the light and the love of Christ because nobody can outrun his love. And when you meet his love, all of a sudden, there's a new start for you. Paul has a new beginning. In Romans chapter five, he writes it this way. He says, he describes it and says, so now we can rejoice in our wonderful new and just circle this word, relationship. Paul found out that religion is a bunch of rules, but a relationship with God is life change. Relationship with God because of our Lord Jesus Christ has made us, what are the last three words of real life? Friends of God. Let's pray about that together. As we begin this series, just hear these words of Paul. This murderer who became a missionary. This intense intense extrovert telling you it's all about his love and he wants to be your friend. Today, would you receive that love? Have you ever invited Jesus into your life? He loves you, he wants to forgive you and just like Paul, he wants to give you a new start, a new beginning. So in faith, would you just whisper this prayer, not out loud, just in your heart, just say, Jesus, I need you, just tell him. And just tell him, Jesus, forgive me for going my own way. And then just pray as best you can and say, as best I know how. Jesus, I ask you to be my Savior and Lord. And I want to follow you from this day forward. Give me a new beginning. Father, as you hear the prayers of faith lifted up across this room and the internet, I ask, God, that you would meet every person in that prayer. And I thank you so much, God, that nothing can separate us from your love. So whatever we've brought into this room, I pray your love would flow through it. And I ask your love to flow over every fear, for your love to cover over every worry, and for your love to cover over every embarrassing, shameful thing from our past. And thank you, Lord, that you can work all things together for the good of those who just choose to love you. And may all of us this day and this week live like we've got a purpose. And may your purpose prevail in our hearts and lives as we take the way we're wired and share with others who our creator is and how much he loves us. 
May the hope and the love and the grace and the mercy of our Lord and Savior be on every heart and home. For we ask it in the name of the one who gives it to us, Jesus Christ. And everybody said, amen. Let's give God a hand for his love and life change.